glory, they all belong to the Lord. Amen? Oh, it's good to be in the house of God one more time. Amen. Yes, it's good God. I can't do it. He watched over us last night. He delivered us by waking us this morning and bringing us to the house of worship. I'm grateful to God just to be alive today. I thank God for Christ Baptist Church, this place where we can come and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. I thank God for the choir who has lifted up the name of the Lord in song. I thank God for our deacons who have already devoted this service to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And now it's prayer time. And if you're able to stand, let us rest to our feet for the Lord's prayer. continue to follow our safety guidelines. That is, continue to wear your mask, refrain from embracing or handshaking. Please continue to maintain social distance. We want to keep everyone as safe as possible. Sunday school continues to be held on Sunday mornings by telephone conference calls. There are three classes each Sunday, starting at 8 a.m., 8.30 a.m., and 11.30 a.m. New members on Tuesday at 5 p.m., and teenagers and young adults 11 a.m. on Saturdays. Please call the church for the, song, for the phone number to join in. Bible study, which is held on Wednesday, is on break until 
on summer break until further notice. Coming, August 1st, Christ Baptist will be celebrating their 40th anniversary. Glory to God. One and all, men and women, are, are you new to Medicare? Just overwhelmed with Medicare? Are you noting gaps in your Medicare coverage? Do you need help with paying for premiums or prescriptions? Join Women for Christ August 7th, virtually at noon, Medicare and you where Darian Collins, a licensed agent for Medicare, will lead us in the discussion. Contact the church office for the phone number as well as handouts that, that Ms. Collins has provided. We encourage all to attend, especially if you are approaching Medicare age. And now the welcome by Ms. Joanne Williams. Let's give her a hand.
Yes, yes. There's so many people want to take credit for things, but to God be the glory. Amen. Let's give God a hand praise for Sister Lonnie. Amen. Yes, you didn't wake yourself up this morning. To God be the glory. Are you able to dress yourself in your right mind? To God be the glory. Thank God for that praise and song. The choir and our music department, Sister Lonnie Hoff, has brought us to the place where we're ready to receive God's word. We're ready to hear a word from God. In this past several weeks, with this pandemic that has plagued us over a year and a half, when I look around and I see that people are attending baseball games almost in full attendance, people are going to concerts and, and music uh, presentations, whatever that thing is in Chicago, Lollapalooza, they're filling up these parks with thousands of people. Just the other day, I, I saw up in Milwaukee, and congratulations to the Milwaukee Bucks, but there were thousands of people out in the streets celebrating. And it seems that life has returned to normal when it comes to sporting events. Life has returned to normal when it comes to concerts and being out and about. But the one place, or really two places that are suffering the most, are the schools and the churches. People can fill up a baseball stadium, but they won't come to church. People can go out to a concert to hear some loud rock and roll music, but they won't come to the house of God. When it comes to the house of God, they say, oh, we're in a pandemic. But when it comes to a concert or a ball game, they say, I'm free to do what I want to do. I want you this morning, the Lord, after prayer and meditation, I asked the Lord to give me a word to address what's going on today. And the Lord led me to the book of Revelation. The Lord led me to uh, the Revelation book, the book that many people are afraid to read. The book that talks about the four horsemen, the book that talks about dragons and swords and seals being broken. The book of Revelation, I want you to turn there in your tablet or your personal Bible or on your phone. I know we've taken the Bibles and hymn books out of the pews because we don't want a lot of touching with the coronavirus. Turn to Revelation 3. Revelation chapter 3. We'll be reading verses 7 through 13 and then we'll drop down to verse 20. In Revelation chapter 3, when you have it, say amen. amen. In Revelation chapter 3, and if you're able to stand, let us rest to our feet for the reading of God's word. Revelation 3, and I'm reading the New International Version, commencing at verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and, not, and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Verse 11 reads, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, 
which is coming down out of heaven from my God, and I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 20 reads, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them, with that person, and they with me. The word of God for the people of God. You may be seated in the presence of Almighty God. Many, many of our sister churches, not only in this community, but throughout the nation, have had to close their doors. And it's so sad to see that sporting venues are open, but church doors are being closed. And so my prayer has been over the last year and a half, and the subject title of our sermon today is this, Lord, keep the door open. Lord, keep the door open. Won't you bow in a moment of prayer? Oh, gracious and merciful Father in heaven, I thank you. I thank you, God, for this opportunity to serve you. I'm humbled by this awesome responsibility. And now, Lord, I pray that you use me as you will. Merchandise your word through me and to me and to these, your people. Let your word go forth with boldness and understanding. Where your name is magnified and glorified, your people are edified and your kingdom is advanced. This is my prayer. I'm your servant and you're my God. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our church has been open now. Next week we're celebrating our 40th anniversary. And to God be the glory that we have overcome obstacles. We have been able to make it through the storms in 40 years, just like Noah was on the ark for 40 days and 40 nights. We have lasted 40 years, but I'm asking God to keep us, keep us another 40 years and another 40 years and another 40 years. We're a young church, but 40 years is a milestone. 40 is moving from infancy into maturity. Because when you turn 40 in life, 40 means that you admit life. You've overcome some things by the time you're 40. There's some things that you've been able to conquer by the time you're 40. And I thank God that we're turning 40 on August the 1st. Amen. Amen. Lord, keep the doors open. In Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus speaks to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Jesus gives this revelation to the Apostle John out on the Isle of Patmos. He tells John to write these things. And of the seven churches that John writes to, Jesus reveals the door that will be open, the church that the doors will remain open. Jesus reveals the type of church that God is looking for. The church at Ephesus was the fallen church. The church at Ephesus had problems. The church at Smyrna was the fearful church. That church was too afraid to step out on faith. The church at Pergamum was the faltering church. The church at Thyatira was the false church which had, which had false teachers. The church at Sardis was the fruitful church. They didn't bring anybody to Christ. But in our text this morning, the church at Philadelphia Although it was a frail and weak church, the church of Philadelphia was able to carry out its work. It was able to do God's will, even though in a small and meager way. It was a feeble church of all the seven churches spoke of in Revelation. Five of these churches were rebuked by the Lord for not being the church that God was looking for. But the church at Philadelphia was not rebuked like the other churches. This church was commended by Jesus. The name Philadelphia, you know, in Greek, the name Philadelphia means brotherly love. The church of Philadelphia, they had moved from a world vision 
They had moved from wanting to be a popular church. They had moved from want to be, wanting to be the church that has the best fried chicken or the best catfish dinners. They had moved from wanting to be a mega church. They had moved from that. They had moved to a spiritual vision. They had moved from that world vision of a church that everybody wants to be a member of that church. They had moved from uh, being that world vision of that's the church that has the best banquets. That's the church that has the best choir, the best musician. That's the church that has the most doctors, the most lawyers, the most teachers. They had moved from that to a spiritual vision of seeking ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto them. This church had moved from ritualism and legalism. They had moved from holding on to the letter of the law, from judging people. They had moved from that to the teachings of Jesus and his loving kindness. They had moved from judging to mercy. They had moved to grace. This church saw the truth of the Lord's birth, life, death, and resurrection. And this church knew that Jesus was coming back soon. This church was that great beacon light of hope. And that's the church that God wants. And that's my prayer for Christ Baptist Church. Lord, keep the doors open. Help us to continue to be that church you want us to be. Help us, Lord, to continue feeding the hungry. Help us to continue to take care of the needy, both physically and spiritually. I pray that we continue to be that great beacon light of hope, that light on the hill, the church that God is looking for. And so the Lord writes to the church of Philadelphia, not to offer blame to them, but to grant them blessings. The Lord writes to the church, John writes to the church, not to threaten them with vengeance or wrath, but to offer them a fresh new vision. Look at how this church looks to the Lord. These are the words of the Lord found in verse 7, in verse 7 of Revelation 3. To the angel of the church at Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, the holy one, the true one. That's the character of God. God is holy. God is true. That's God's character. He's so holy that Isaiah saw a vision of seraphims flying around with six wings. He's so holy that Isaiah said they covered their faces with two wings because they couldn't look on his holiness. Isaiah says with two wings they covered their feet because they couldn't touch his holiness. Isaiah says and with two wings they did fly and singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He's holy. He's holy and he's true. He's so true that you can stand on his word. He's true just like Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. Jesus stood on the word of God. When the devil knew he was hungry and said, if you be the son of God, command these stones be made bread. Jesus stood on the truth of the word, saying, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. He is holy and he is true. He's so holy that when Moses asked him, God, show me your glory. The Lord God said, I can't show you my glory. I can't show you all of my holiness, Moses. If I did, you'd drop right there on the spot. I can't show you my glory. He's so holy that God said it would be too much for you, Moses. He told Moses, I'll show you. I'll pass by you. I'll let you see my back. In fact, Moses, I'm going to have to put you in the cleft of the rock. I'm going to have to put you in one of these crevices of the rock. And when I pass by, you better hold on because I'm so holy. And I could imagine when God passed by Moses, that whole mountain shook. And Moses had to hold on for his life. God is so holy. He's so true that when it comes to God's holiness, we can't even look upon God. He's so holy and he's so true. He's so true that whatever God speaks has to come to pass. God cannot lie. He's so true that he can be trusted. Not only is he holy, not only is he true, the Bible says he holds the key of David in his hand. 
The key of David church is a metaphor for having complete control of the royal house. Whoever has the keys has control. The one who holds the key in ancient days is referred to as the major domo. It means that he controls the entrance to the royal palace. He controls who gets into glory. He controls who comes to God. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except by me. That means Jesus has the key. Whoever has the key has access. Whoever has the key has authority. And Jesus has authority because he holds the key of David. He opens doors that no man can shut. He shuts doors that no man can open because he holds the key. He is the Christ. He has all power. He has all authority in his hands. He holds the key of David. The church God is looking for is the church that worships Christ, is the church that worships Jesus, the Lord and our Savior, who has all power and all authority in his hand. A church that knows that he's holy, a church that knows that he is true, a church that knows that he has all power in his hand. Look at the condition of the church. Verse 8. Verse 8, Jesus says, I know your deeds. The King James Version says, I know your works. I know your strengths. I know your weaknesses. I know what you can do, and I know what you can't do. In this revelation, Jesus is saying, I know you're a small church. I know you're a weak church. I know your works. I know you have just a little power, but your human weakness does not stop the power of God. Because we are weak, because we fall short, does not hinder the power of Almighty God. God's greatness is worked through our weakness. Remember the Apostle Paul said, a thorn in my side was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me unless I be exalted. The Apostle Paul said he went to the Lord three times asking the Lord to move it. But God, in, in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, God said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. God uses weak things of this world to overcome the wisdom of the wise. God takes sinners saved by grace, sinners saved by grace like you and like me, to come out on Sunday morning to teach God's word, to come out on Sunday morning and sing God's praises, to usher at the door. God uses sinners saved by grace like you and me to preach God's word. God's power is manifested even though we are weak. In our weakness, God is strong because it's God's strength that brought you out here this morning. It's God's strength that woke you up this morning. And in your own mind, in my mind, we could say to ourselves, I don't want to come out today. I want to stay in bed this morning. But the power of God will move you to come to God's house of worship to worship him in spirit and in truth. It's the power of God that allows the blood to keep running warm in your veins. It's the power of God that gave you the activity of your limbs that allowed you to feed yourself this morning. The power of God, God's power, God's power is made manifest through our weakness. The Lord is commending this church because of their faithfulness. Although they could do very little, they held on to their faith. The Lord is commending them and their faithfulness leads to an open door. Verse 8 again, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I don't care how small a church you are, how large of a church you are. If you keep the Lord's word and not deny his name, God will place an open door before you. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing whenever the Lord says, I have opened the door for you. I have given you access. Whenever the Lord opens a door for you, that's a blessing. That's an opportunity. When God opens doors, you know there have been some doors shut in our face as black people. But God will open that door. There have been people who have stood in the door to keep you from getting in. But God will move them and God will open the door. 
oh, what a blessing whenever God opens doors. And whenever you read in the scriptures, scriptures about doors being open, whenever you read about an open door, that's an opportunity to witness for the Lord. A door represents access. A door represents access or denial, depending on whether the door is open or closed. There's something about doors in the Bible. There's something about doors in the Bible. During this pandemic, pastors throughout this region would meet every Tuesday. We would meet at one of the churches and, and we would share with one another what's going on in our church, what's going on at your church. Pastors throughout Northwest Indiana and South Side of Chicago, we would meet and talk about what did you preach Sunday? What, what, what happened at your church this past week? We would do that. The sad testimony is that we haven't been able to fellowship. Pastors haven't been able to come together because of this COVID-19. And the sad testimony also is that some of our sister churches have had to close their doors. And my prayer is God to restore them. God, bring us through this pandemic and, and restore these churches. Open the doors again. And I pray, God, that you keep our doors open. There's something about doors in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 18, when the Lord appeared to Abraham while he was sitting in the door of his tent, that's fellowship. In Exodus chapter 12, the blood of the lamb was sprinkled on the mantle and the doorpost and the death angel passed over that house. That's redemption. There's something about doors in the Bible. In Leviticus chapter one, God said, present your offering at the door of the tabernacle so that it will be acceptable to God. That's stewardship. There's something about doors in the Bible. In the 84th Psalm, David said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. That's service. There's something about doors in the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. In John's gospel chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the door. There's something about doors in the Bible. And in our scripture today, in Revelations 3 and 20, Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. There's something about doors in the Bible. Doors are an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. I pray that there'll be an open door for somebody today when this sermon is finished today. I pray that the door will be open and somebody will give their life to Jesus. I pray that there will be an open door for somebody on their job tomorrow. I pray that when you go out from this place, when you go out to eat this afternoon or wherever you go this afternoon, that you be an open door and introduce somebody to Jesus Christ. I want God to open some doors. I, I, I want God to open some doors, not just to receive blessings, but so that someone may be a blessing to someone else. Show them the way to salvation. Yes, God wants a church full of people, but God wants people to go out who are willing to go out and bring others to Jesus. The open door of the Lord. Ask the Lord to help you to become that open door. Let's go out and invite those who are lost. Let's go out and be an open door to gather those up who have gone astray, to encourage the downtrodden to come to Jesus. There are too many closed door people out there. There are too many people who are not inviting. They're more disinviting. Too many people who don't encourage, they discourage people from coming to church. There are too many closed doors. People who say things like, why are you going to that church? You don't need to go to church every Sunday. Why well, I wouldn't be going up there trying to listen to that boring preacher. I heard he was a teacher, so I know he's boring. <laughs> why? Those are closed doors closed doors, but the Bible says, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. There's something about doors in the Bible. Now, now this isn't in the scripture today, but God, he opens doors and he also closes doors. And I thank God that sometimes closed doors are blessings too. Yes, yeah, some closed doors. God, God will open some doors, but he'll shut some doors. He'll close some things off. Some things that he knows you don't need in your life. 
God knows you don't need that. God will close some doors. God knows if you have gotten those things, if you had gone through that door, you'd be worse off today than you were. He knows that. Think of where you'd be if God hadn't closed that door. Think of where you'd be if, if God allowed those things into your life. Yes, it's a blessing. It's a blessing when God opens doors, but don't miss the blessing when God shuts a door. There are some things and even some people that don't need to be in your life. Close that door. Close the door on that. Think of where you'd be if you kept hanging around them. Think about where you'd be if that door stayed open. Yes, thank God for open doors, but hallelujah to God for closed doors. God will open some doors and God will close some doors. And here's our problem. Sometimes when God closes the door, God will, will shut that out of your life. Our problem is, is we keep on putting our hand on that doorknob. We keep going over there. That door's closed and we keep on trying to open it. Let me open it one more time. God, no, I've closed that door. It's time to move on. God will close some doors. Verse 8, again, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Jesus has opened the windows of opportunity for this church. Jesus has opened the windows of opportunity for the church in Philadelphia, although it's a weak church. But when you couple your weakness with the Lord's strength, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. When you couple your weakness with the Lord's strength, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When you put together your weakness with the Lord's strength, there's nothing too hard for God. Verse 9, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Jesus said, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. This world is trying to steal your crown. This world is trying to take what you have they're trying, to, they're trying to take your faith. The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But hold on to your faith. This is the challenge to the church. When you connect your weakness to God's strength, you can hold fast to what you have. In verse 9, Jesus says, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, I will make them fall at your feet and let them know that I love you. This synagogue of Satan, there are some people who their whole ministry is to try to tear you down. That's the synagogue of Satan. It's a challenge to hold fast to Jesus when the synagogue of Satan is trying to stop you. It's a challenge when you're trying to do right and the hellhounds are always on your trail. It's a challenge when you're trying to serve the Lord and you're being lied on, you're being criticized. You're just trying to serve God's people and people are trying to tear you down. Jesus says, hold fast to what you have. He refers to them as the synagogue of of Satan, those who are trying to tear down the church. They claim to be Jews, but they're not. They're liars, and we're surrounded by liars today. Every time you turn on the TV, you hear some lies. Every time you try to watch the news, you hear some lies. And they're liars, and the truth ain't in them. The Lord says, hold fast, hold on to your faith, let them keep on lying. You hold on to your faith and you let them keep on blaspheming. Hold on to your faith. Let them keep on digging ditches and setting traps. But Jesus said, I'm going to let them know I love you because the ditch they dig, they're going to fall in it. The trap they set, they're going to get caught in it. God is saying, you hold on to your faith. He says, hold on to your faith. Jesus said, I'll let them know that I love you. Why? Because you have kept my word and not denied my name. I like that right there. You have kept my word in this pandemic and you have not denied my name during this COVID-19. You have kept my word in the good times. You haven't denied my name in the bad times. In the up times, you kept my word. And in the down times, you didn't deny my name. When you were up on the mountain of hallelujah, you kept my word. When you were down in the valley of sorrow, you didn't deny my name. 
You kept my word in the sunshine and you didn't deny my name in the storm. There's still some people out there today who love God's name. All that they've been through, they still love the Lord's name. There's some people who are holding fast to God's word. I know there's somebody in here this morning that grew up in racism and segregation. They grew up down south somewhere in Alabama, Mississippi, or Tennessee. They couldn't go to school the way they wanted to go because of segregation. But they still love God's name. There's somebody in here today. They love to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. They've been mistreated. They've been lied on. They've been misrepresented, but they love God's name. Jesus loves a church like that, that never denies his name. I'm so glad that Daniel one day, he didn't deny the Lord's name. When Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel, you need to stop praying. Daniel said, I got to keep his word and I can't deny his name. They threw him down in the lion's den. But Daniel's faith was so strong that he slept among some hungry lions. He used one lion as a pillow and another lion as a footrest and slept all night. Come here, three Hebrew boys. They kept God's word and they didn't deny the Lord's name. When Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm gonna throw you into a fiery furnace if you don't bow down to the image. They said, even if God doesn't rescue us, we know that our God is able. They kept his word. They didn't deny God's name. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. If they're criticizing you for your service, you just hold on. If they got something to say about your praise, make sure you hold on. If they're discouraging the way you give, just hold on. Hold fast to what you have. Don't let anybody take your crown. I'm going to close when I tell you this. Here's the blessing right in verse 12. Here's your reward. It's right in verse 12. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. A pillar in the temple is a special place in glory. Not only do you have a special place, not only do you have a secure place, a place that you'll never leave. But here's the blessing. Jesus said, I'm going to write on them. I'm going to write on your soul. I'm going to put on your soul so the Lord recognizes you. I'm going to write on them the name of my God. I'm going to write on them the name of the city of my God. And then I'm also going to write my own name. Signed, sealed, delivered. When you hold on to what you have, God will put his mark on you. God will put his seal on you. His mark is not a tattoo. His seal is not a branding. God's seal, God's mark is the threefold blood mark. Is the threefold blood mark. When the death angel flew over Egypt, every house that had the threefold blood mark, the death angel passed over it. Blood on the doorposts and blood on the mantle. That means blood over the top, blood on the left side, blood on the right side. That's the threefold blood mark. That's God's seal on you. You are sealed in the blood of Jesus. He'll put his seal on you. And then Jesus said, I'm going to put God's name on you. I'm going to put God's address on you. And then I'm going to put my own name on you. That will say that again. He said, I'm going to put God's name on you. I'm going to put the address where you're going on you. And then I'm going to put my own name on you. If that ain't enough, I'm going to seal you in my name. That tells me I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven in the name of Jesus. I'm a child of God. I'm signed. I'm sealed. And I'm delivered. I'm a child of God. I've got his name on me. El Shaddai. Elohim. Almighty God. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Rapha. Jehovah Yahweh. I got his name on me. I'm a child of God. I carry his name down in my soul. And I have his address. I'm on my way to a new city. I'm on my way to New Jerusalem. I'm on my way 
way to glory. Where the streets are paved with gold, the gates are lined with pearls. A city that has 12 gates. I'm on my way because there are three gates in the east, three gates in the west, three gates in the north, and three gates in the south. Twelve gates to the city. Hallelujah. I'm on my way to glory. And then Jesus put his name on me. In the name of Jesus. Everywhere I go. In the name of Jesus. When I sit down at the dinner table. I thank God for this food. In the name of Jesus. I've got Jesus' name on me. He woke me up this morning. In the name of Jesus. Brought me out. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith. In the name of Jesus, the bright and morning star, the captain of my salvation, my deliverer, the door, the eternal God, everlasting Father. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to stop in a minute. I know you're tired of me. In the name of Jesus. Say that name. In the name of Jesus, Joshua's battle axe, Noah's ark, Abel's avenger, a rock in the weary land, the rock of ages, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. In the name of Jesus, in the name of the one who died on Calvary. In the name of Jesus, who hung, bled, and died, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the name of Jesus, who died till the sun went out like sackcloth of ashes, who died till the moon refused to shine. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, put him down in an old dusty grave, stayed there all night Friday, all day Saturday, all night Saturday night. In the name of Jesus, I don't know what time it was, but they tell me it was early. Hand. I'm signed, sealed, and delivered. God will put his name on you. God will put the address on you. Then he'll put his own name on you. We're on our way somewhere. This world is not our home. We're just pilgrim travelers on our way to glory. I just ask the Lord to keep the doors open so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. God bless you today. The doors to my father's house are open. The doors are open. I offer the invitation to discipleship as we rest to our feet. Now is the time and this is the place. Man, woman, boy or girl, unchurched, unsaved or uncommitted, won't you come? Won't you come? Give your life to Jesus. It's all about you now. Now is the time and this is the place. Man, woman, boy, or girl. You may come as a candidate for baptism. You may come on Christian experience, reaffirmation of faith. You may come in search of a church home. The invitation is yours. Won't you come? To our friends who are watching by way of social media, I offer that same invitation to you. Since you can't be here today, the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father in heaven, you shall be saved. Make that confession today. And my prayer is that once you make that confession, God put a covering on you. That God order your steps from this day forward. Make that confession today. And once you make that confession, make sure that you get into a good Bible reading Bible Teaching Church. We would love to have you here at Christ Baptist Church, but if you can't make it here, make sure you get under the tutelage of a good Bible teaching church. God bless you. The doors to my father's house are open. Man, woman, boy, or girl, won't you come? Ministers are standing in the aisles, waiting for you to come. The 
deacons are waiting for you. The choir is singing. It's all about you now. The doors to my father's house are open. set aside as our deacons readjust. This is a time we set aside for reflection and meditation. While so music director and musicians play for us music of meditation where we allow the word of God and the preach word to fill the sanctuary and penetrate hearts. It's meditation time where we can thank God for all that he's done for us since we were together last. All the blessings that he's bestowed upon us. It's meditation time. known to God so that the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and minds 
through Christ Jesus. It's prayer time. And there are so many who are on the prayer list. We want to make sure we lift them up. Those who are watching by way of social media, our members who are watching from home, you will see those names scroll across the screen as we lift up those who are sick and shut in, those who are convalescing at home, those who aren't able to come out, you see their names on the prayer list. It's prayer time and Deacon James Martin is coming with the altar prayer. And I wanna make sure we lift up one of our own servants, Deacon Mario Green, who, who had to say farewell to her aunt. She's traveling, she's out of town and she'll be back midweek. She asked for traveling mercy. It's prayer time. Lift up all those who have had a visit by the death angel. Brother Nimrod Eckridge is coming now with this week's spoken prayer request. Thank you, Pastor. My Christ Baptist family, we ask all to continue to pray for those on our prayer list as the name scrolls across the screen as well as any and all unknown prayer requests. Specifically, please continue to pray for the bereaved families it is with heartfelt sorrow that we announce the transition of Dorothy Mosley, as the pastor said, the aunt of our own, Deacon Muriel Green, Candace Raymond Raybar. Arrangements are, visitation is today, July 25th, from 1 to 3 p.m. at EH4 Mortuary, and that's in Memphis, Tennessee. There will be a grace, graveside service tomorrow at 11 a.m. at National Cemetery in Jackson, Mississippi. The family asks for traveling mercy and grace. Also, Mr. Eric Adams, the nephew of Harold Cloud, our member at Usher. Service were held yesterday in Gary. Also, Floyd Foster Jr., the brother of our own Doris Herbie. Pastor, those were our prayer requests. Amen. Amen. Church, you've heard the spoken prayer request for the week, and we all stand in the need of prayer, and it's prayer time. Thanks be to God, Deacon James Martin is, is here now. He's coming with the altar prayer. we take everything to God in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you one more time, dear God, for bringing us back out, dear God, to your sanctuary. Thank you, Jesus, for blessing on our church and our church family, that our doors are open, dear God, and oh, Heavenly Father, that you keep them open. And dear God, you fill us with the Holy Spirit, Jesus, to come back and serve you and do your will. We just want to thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this day, dear God. Oh, and the Father, that you have bestowed upon us. Because, dear God, you are our shepherd. You are our God. You are our Savior. Oh, and the Father, we thank you, Jesus, for going on the cross for our sins and rising from the grave for our salvation. Oh, and Father, we thank you for blessing on our pastor, Pastor Robinson, preaching and teaching your word, dear God. Oh, and Father, you continue to undergird him, dear God. Oh, and Father, as he preach and teach your word. Pray for his family. Oh, and Father, 
Touch them, Jesus. Keep them safe from harm and danger. We pray for each and every member, dear God, of our church. We pray for our congregation. We pray for the ministers and ministers of our church, each and every one, dear God, that we be all about serving you. Touch us, Jesus, in a mighty way. Touch our deacons, dear God, our trustees. Touch each and every one of us, dear God, that we reach out to others, dear God, to encourage others to have you first in their lives. Oh, and Father, we pray for the sick. We pray for the shut-in. Oh, and Father, that you continue to strengthen you, strengthen them, that your healing powers continue to be on them, dear God. Oh, and Father, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. You know all about them, Jesus. Touch our children, dear God. Oh, and Father, as the schools prepare to open back up, and dear God, we have children, our children going back into the schools. Dear God, that they have a safe environment to go to school in. Oh, and Father, touch the mamas and the fathers and the daddies and the grandparents and the sisters and the brothers. Touch our church family, dear God, that we be there for our children, the teachers and the school administrators, that they be there for them with love. Oh, and Father, we pray, dear God, for healings. Pray, to God, that our children would not be tempted by others, all the things to do wrong. That they know right from wrong, and they does what's right. Dear God, we pray these prayers in your name. Because, dear God, we know, dear God, what's going on in this world. Oh, and Father, sinful and evil things. But we know, dear God, that you're with us. If we put our faith in you, dear God, that you would cover us, you would protect us. And, dear God, that this city, this community, will be a better place for all people to live in. We pray, dear God, for those, dear God, that have lost loved ones. Dear God, that you continue to cover each and every one of us. Give us strength, dear God. We pray for traveling mercies for those, dear God, that might be traveling. Deacon Merrill Green and family, that your mercy and grace and traveling mercies be upon them. And dear God, that they find everything better than it was when they left. We just want to thank you, Jesus, for all you've done, all you're doing. We pray for the sick, dear God. There's so much sickness going on. We pray, dear God, that you contain this coronavirus, of ours. Oh, Heavenly Father, because, dear God, we know, dear God, that you're able. And, dear God, that no more of your children will be affected by it. And, dear God, those that have been affected by it will be healed completely. We pray. Pray these prayers in your name, dear God. And I just want to thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your healing powers. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, and the Father, I just can't thank you enough. Touch us, Jesus. Have mercy upon us, dear God. Oh, and the Father, give us love, joy, and peace. In your name, dear God. And dear God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. Each and every day. Dear God, have mercy upon us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. You have your envelope, your offertory envelope. Let's take a moment now and prepare offertory envelopes. We here in the sanctuary, once those are completed, you will deposit them in the offertory boxes located in the rear of the sanctuary upon dismissal. It's offering time. And I want to thank God for you, the members of Christ Baptist Church, you who support your church. I'm grateful to God for all that you do for your church. I thank God for those who are watching by way of social media, all that you've done for us, all the donations that you have rendered to God's house of worship. You'll see on your screen the variety of ways that you can give to Christ Baptist Church. We thank God for you. We also want you to hit the like button and follow us on, on the social media pages. Become a friend and member of Christ Baptist Church. 
I can't thank God enough for you. I thank God for all that you do for God's house of worship. It's offering time. Let us bow now with the offertory prayer. Father, we thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. And now, Lord, that we have this opportunity to give back that a portion of which you've given to us. Help us to understand that it all belongs to you. So God, I ask that you bless both gift and giver. Bless those who have the desire to give. And then, oh God, use these gifts to your glory. This is our prayer. We are your children and you're our God. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We prepare for a dismissal. Our officers have taken their places in the rear of the sanctuary to ensure that no one is stepping over each other, that we dismiss by way of social distancing. I thank God for you all understanding that we're following the rules of the CDC. We're following the rules continually now to make sure that all stays safe. As we prepare to go out from this place, let us stand to our feet now for our closing music and benediction. Were you blessed by the service today? Give God a hand praise for our choir. Give God a hand praise for our music director and our musicians. Amen. Give God a mighty hand praise for yourselves today. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you. Father, we thank you for all that our eyes have seen all that our ears have heard and all that our hearts have felt. We thank you, Lord, for every song of praise. We thank you for the opportunity to render prayers unto thee. We thank you, Lord, for your word today, and we especially thank you for Jesus. And now as we prepare to go out from this place, but not out of your presence, we pray, O oh God, that you go ahead of us, you go before us, that you make a way for us, but most importantly, God, go with us. Now may the grace of God as Father and as Son and the sweet communion of God as Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide in each of these thy people now, henceforth, and forevermore, world without end, and all of God's people can say together, Amen. Amen. God bless you. See you next Sunday. God keep you in Jesus' name.